like we as creatives, him and I love this idea of intuition, love this idea of creativity, but we're trying to get business results, right? So what is the application of intuition in the business world? Again, it's just the process of thinking for yourself, finding answers within your context. Welcome to the Magnificent Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top marketing experts in the world and keep you up to date on all the changes and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Jay Acunzo, and Jay is an award-winning podcaster, a dynamic keynote speaker, and a veteran digital and content marketer. He was a digital media strategist at Google and head of content for multiple, multiple startups, including HubSpot. He spent several years scaling a venture capital firm called NextView using content marketing and narrative storytelling, and he is now the host and producer of several web series about the meaning people find in the work they do. Over the past decade, Jay has built editorial strategies from scratch for startups and produced attention-grabbing shows about intuition at work. He's toured the world speaking to organizations big and small about the power of questioning best practices, and his work has been cited in courses at Harvard Business School, by writers at the New York Times and the Washington Post, and by investors on TV's Shark Tank. In a world overflowing with gurus, Jay is here to be a guide. He doesn't have any answers. Instead, it's his firm belief that you do, and it's his mission to help you own in and trust your intuition to do more exceptional work. And today, we are going to be talking about the danger and best practices. Jay, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate that intro. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's that's pretty impressive. It's amazing. <laughs> and and I let me just give a shout out. You're, you're one of my top four or five speakers that I love watching speak. It, oh, wow. Thank uh, you. You're, you're just engaging and fun and hilarious. And and uh, you drive home a lot of points. And um, that, that's not a, a, a kiss up statement. It, 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 it is uh, the truth. And um, if you listen to the other podcasts, you will hear that I don't say that every single time. Although thank you. They're, so they're all awesome. But you are one of my top five favorites. Love it. So, wow. Let's uh, let's dig in here. Uh, in, in doing some research here, I started to wrap my head around around what you were saying, and you know, and it's it's actually some advice my my wife gave me a while back when we were you know getting into a lot of tactical execution and all this. She's like, Dave, don't forget your roots. You know, don't forget uh, you know good old fashioned creativity and 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 not just you know being a robot, but to to kind of have you kick this off, I, I loved how you phrased this as I was doing my research here. Intuition at work, the danger in following best practices. Can, can you explain further what you mean by this so we can just set the stage today? Yeah, let's start with the danger in following best practices because I think if we understand the like opponent we're up against, then the solution – it almost becomes either logical or it doesn't matter. I think what matters is we know the, the opponent and figure out a solution that works for us. So best practices. We, like nobody actually aspires to be average in their work, uh-huh. but we think about best practices like they're going to deliver the best results for us. And they almost never do because they're what I would call faulty equations. They don't take into account all the variables of your specific contest. So they're what works in general, but nobody operates in a generality. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's my belief and, and all the stories I'm telling on my show are kind of revealing this, that if you want to do something exceptional, you have to find and follow what makes your situation an exception. So rather than obsess over yet another best practice, more conventional wisdom, the past precedent, the trendy tactic, rather than go there to find clarity, I think great work happens when you try to find your answers from within your own context, right? Mm -hmm. You, your your own self-awareness, the awareness of your team, what you understand about your customers, the limited resources you have, the goals you have, everything about your context holds clues for you to do better work. And for some reason, and I think the, the reason is it's so easy to do this, we immediately turn to Google and YouTube and social and friends and case studies, and we look for their kind of general right answers. And, and I think that's bonkers. I think it's backwards. All right. Awesome. What, what brought you to that line of thinking? I, uh, I'm somebody who's bothered by suck <laughs> <laughs> is the way I would phrase it. A friend of mine told me that once. He's like, Jay, you want to work with people who are bothered by suck? I, I've worked in marketing my whole career and there's just so many best practices and tips and tricks and sheets and hacks. And, you know, as a writer, it's an easy example. You look around the blogosphere and you see all this sameness, all this 
junk, like efficient content that people try to churn out and they expect some great result because some guy on Medium talked about how they got crazy results with very little resources, you know, in not a lot of time. And it's <laughs> like, seen, I've seen that blog post. Stuff, <laughs> It's total, it's total, it's a crock. It's an absolute lie. Um, but I think we've all been sold a more fundamental lie than the easy gurus shilling secrets. The fundamental lie is, you know, we were told that best practices will get the best results for us. But I don't think that's possible unless we somehow add in the us. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that's missing when we, you know, it, we, the year just turned over. So now we're all buzzing about what will 2018 be the year of? It's going to be AI. It's going to be ABM, whatever. Um, it doesn't matter because every year we find these saviors, we worship them, they have hype, and then they plateau it fine or go away entirely. And we're on to the next yeah. one. And so to me, the analogy I always use is like we're stuck on this wheel. And the wheel is just full of best practices and conventional wisdom and tactics that are trending. You know, it's like all these things are spokes on a wheel and it just heads straight to this place we don't want to be, which is average work. Mm -hmm. and, and so the solution isn't to find some guru to help you see ahead to the next spoke. It's not to stretch across multiple spokes and spread yourself thin. And it's certainly not to just spin the wheel faster and faster and, and do everything. Mm -hmm. The solution is to break that wheel entirely, get out of the cycle entirely and begin your process by understanding what you're all about in your context because that's like a filter that you can use to make sense of all that other mm -hmm. stuff yeah and, and i don't think you're <clears throat> i mean as, as smart as in, ingenuitive as you are I, I think this line of thinking started a long time ago and i think you even referenced like albert einstein you know he was talking about this a long time ago C can you explain what you were mentioning that when i was looking into that for well, sure. He talked about intuition a little bit. It's a quote that's kind of in debate, but largely uh, accepted to be from Einstein. And I'll give you the quote and what he said in a second. But the important point here is um, I was looking for a word to use to describe this skill that we can hone, right? Because if it's not just the tactical tips mm -hmm. and tricks, which are now everywhere, always changing and table stakes, right? They're instantly on demand. Um, if it's not that that we're looking for, what skill are we honing? You know, it's this ability to pull out our answers from within our context. And there, the name of that is, I think, intuition. And it's not because it's this muse that visits you or even this knee-jerk reaction. If you look at the root of the word intuition, it comes from the Latin intuir, which just means knowledge from mm -hmm. within. And, and then historically, we have all these thinkers that try to define intuition for us. And I think that clouds our judgment. Like Einstein, he says, intuition is our most sacred gift and the rational mind is a servant of that gift. And that sounds amazing, but I don't quite understand like how to go about my day now. So I'm right back to looking on Google or Twitter for my answers because those seem practical and simple. <laughs> um, Malcolm Gladwell in the book Blink talked about intuition as rapid cognition. And, you know, he said basically that we have snap judgments. Some are good and some are bad. He's not there to tell us how to come up with those judgments. He's just trying to put up a stop sign and say, pay attention to your snap judgments that's useful, kind of shines a light on something, but it doesn't really help me execute in a business mm -hmm. context. And, you know, there's other thinkers in psychology. There's people like Gary Klein and Gerd Gigerenzer who are uh, basically researching intuition or decision-making is really their field. And they talk about subconscious reasoning. They have slightly different flavors. Klein talks about it like you come up with an answer subconsciously from your past experience. You know, basically you notice stuff subtly. You don't really notice the stuff on the street, but you're walking by it and absorbing it. This is a concept called priming. It's things you noticed, but don't really like consciously mm -hmm. witness or sure. consciously think about, but later they, they inform your decision later. Um, that's Klein. Giga Renzer talks about, you know, intuition is parsing what information is useful and what is not. And, and I really like that last one because I think that's what we're caught in this mode of. We're in, we're in this mode of trying to vet information because there's so much of it. And like, you know, you think about the information age, but, but, there's a dark side to all that, which is advice overload. And when we feel stressed, or we want great results, we immediately find some best practice to get better results. And that's not trusting our intuition. That's not hunting for answers, you know, within our teams, our specific situations at all. It's throwing ourselves out of the equation and using some generality to find our way forward. Like I said, I think that's Yeah, broken. no, I hear what you're saying, you know, and you're, and you're not saying not to follow best tactical execution, but you're listening, hey, those are table stakes. Yes, 
you need to distribute your stuff. You need to, you know, do your, you know, repurpose, you know, through email marketing and through pushing everything. But what are you going to be pushing out? You know, where do you start? And and you're, you're touching on some things. Did a podcast the other day with Michael Brenner, and it was about tapping into your employees, you know, and, and I feel like that might be a source for some of this intuition, finding out what makes you unique, finding, I love what you said, to be exceptional, you got, you got to have an exception, right? So I, I, first of all, am I following you, right? Am I following, like, what are we going to put yeah, like into this steam engine? What coals, what kind of awesome, you know, unique stuff, what kind of gas are we going to be putting into this engine? Is that, you know, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. So David, I was an English literature major. So I speak in like 65% analogies and metaphors. I had had a spoken analogy. So that's where I get it. So, so here's, here's one I would give. Let's, let's visualize this together as my, as my dog goes crazy Uh, outside this room. We're we're very dog friendly Um, over here. Magnificent. So it's all good. (laughs) There you go. There you go. He's excited about this topic. So, um, so I visualize it like we're staring at this pile of like information pouring down on our heads, right? It's your ideas, your bosses, your clients, your teams. It's the past precedent in your job, the case study from a business you admire, the stories and advice you get on podcasts or in blogs, the trends, the flavors of the week, your favorite thinkers, you know, the hucksters out there that game systems to masquerade as good thinkers, all that stuff is this mound of things somebody's now pouring on your head or you're pouring on yourself when you try to find clarity in a given situation. And what we usually do to move from that total confusion to clarity actually biases our thinking to the wrong things. There's three common behaviors. The first is because it's such a mess, we look for whatever carries the most weight and we act on that, right? This is the conventional wisdom approach. We've been doing it this way for years, or in general, people in this position or in this industry or job do this. It's conventional thinking. And what we're doing when we act on conventional thinking is we're acting or we're informing our thinking or biasing towards whatever is most common. Doing what's most common doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a great result or build anything exceptional, right? So so that's kind of flawed. The second thing we then do okay, if it's not conventional thinking, well, we're going to be innovative. We're going to be out on the bleeding edge. How many times do you hear that Mm -hmm. phrase in the business world? We're going to bias our thinking towards what's most recent. And this promises to be the latest and greatest. It's the trend of 2018. It's the, you know, I'm a podcaster. So it's like everybody's jumping on podcasting. And it's just our bias is there towards whatever is newest. Doing whatever is newest doesn't guarantee you're going to do something exceptional. So the last approach which doesn't always go in order like this. But the third approach is we base our actions on just nothing at all. We're just grabbing at stuff. We're doing a little things from the past. We're trying to glom onto the things that are new. And then we pick up and drop all these tactics. It's the hasty email from your boss saying, what's our Snapchat strategy (laughs) or the logo suit. You don't even understand how much that resonates. Oh my God. It, this happens more often in the business world than some people want to admit. And everyone else is nodding and going, oh no, this is exactly oh, my life. I right think now. it's a 90% like, of people who have a, have a boss. They come in and they're <laughs> not really in tune. And then they just randomly pop in and say, what about this? And you know, who knows? I might be right. guilty of that. And, I, and I'm glad to bring awareness to it, you know, because I know the feeling from the back end. But, you know, when you're doing something, you need to be aware of that you could be doing that. So, but I know exactly what you're talking about. It's a very, and it's not productive. Right. So if those are the three ways you act, and the third one, by the way, you're biasing your thinking towards just activities, like completing a bunch of stuff. You know, you put up a report on the board and you talk about the number of pieces you shipped or the updates that you gave or, you know, the tickets you answered or whatever, the number of people who opened your emails. You're just biasing towards activities and doing stuff, not results. So this is in a way putting tactics Mm -hmm. over strategy. Putting tactics over strategy in no way guarantees you're going to get exceptional Mm -hmm. results. So in all three of these common scenarios, to make sense of advice overload, when you bias your thinking towards what's most common or what's most recent or what allows you to do something most frequently or easiest, there's Mm -hmm. something missing. We shouldn't bias towards those things. We should bias towards whatever works Mm -hmm. for us. But when we think like that, we're missing the us. So my whole thing is, if you want to do something exceptional, if you want best practices to actually yield the best results for you, you have to consider you, your situation. You have to add back in the us. And if you start there, if you understand very firmly 
the, the core components of your specific situation. There's you and your team, the people doing the work. There's, there's your customer, your audience, your, maybe even your client or boss, the people receiving the work. Then there's your resources, the means to make the work happen. If you know those three things really well, they're kind of like a filter. So as stuff pours onto your head really quickly, some things make it through and some things don't, right? It's not you have to be on Snapchat. You have to do what works for you. But if you don't know what you're trying to do and you don't understand your context, that's impossible. So we need to start there All right. instead. I, I hear you. So let, let's circle back a little bit to that point. You know, you, you convince everybody, hey, we, we want to really be driven by intuition and, and, and being exceptional. And that's going to come from our unique and creative ideas, right? And But let, let's, let's try to do our best to get people into tapping into, marching into, you know, intuition. And I think, I, I, I think how you put it uh, somewhere where I read a, a while back was, you know, let's march into, into intuition and out of the nebulous and into reality that I believe Char, uh, Chase Jarvis talked about. And I believe you mentioned that there were four key things to kind of get you in this mindset to help you through that. Um, can you speak on that? Let's try to get people into that state. Yeah, Chase Jarvis, for those who are unfamiliar, he's the founder and CEO of Creative Live, which is a live streaming education company that focuses on creative and entrepreneurial fields. Um, Chase is a world famous photographer, you know, big social media name. And he came on my show and we talked about this concept of intuition, basically poking the bear. Like we as creatives, him and I love this idea of intuition, love this idea of creativity, but we're trying to get business results, right? So what is the application of intuition in the business world? Again, it's just the process of thinking for yourself, finding answers within your context. And, and Chase's phrase was, the muse is an excuse. We, also look, we always look for some external reason, whether the external reason is a best practice, trend, or precedent, or maybe in some, some people's case, they don't care about that stuff. They actively reject it, but their problem is they're still going external to some God-given gift, some inspiration that strikes. Um, you know, I think it's, Oh man, I'm going to forget the guy's name. Is it Charles Close? I'm totally going to forget this painter's name, but there's a great quote out there that's like, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just sit <laughs> down and do the work. And and so like, let's take this intuition stuff, yeah, out of the squishy exactly. and into the practical. Um, and, and before I get to the theory, because we're getting really theory heavy here, let me give you an example. Um, one of my favorite examples is Merriam-Webster Dictionary. So believe it or not, and some people might be new to this, but the dictionary is like straight up killing it on social media. Yeah. They have such a big, loyal, passionate following, and, but it started in a very different place. It started in not such a great spot. So, so the chief digital officer at Merriam-Webster is Lisa Schneider. And her team, she says, is really warm and wonderful, but their marketing was really bland and predictable. They were putting stuff on repeat because that's the best practice, like on Twitter. Um, so what she did is she reset. She observed the team internally talking to each other. And she noticed they were really witty and not using that at all in their marketing. And she was like, okay, enough is enough. And she created what I call an aspirational anchor, which basically combines your intent for the future and some kind of dissatisfaction you have with your work today. Her aspirational anchor for the team was let's show the world how fun and relevant mm -hmm. we really are. Now, what this does is it elevates your gaze it makes the object like the process or the service you provide, not the outcome, like the metric. Because most marketing leaders, if you're trying to fix Twitter or grow an audience, they say stuff like, let's grow our followers this percent month over month. And now you're not inspiring anybody and you're causing those people, because they're so focused on the outcome, to run over to Google and figure out how do you grow your followers instead of look within. Well, what are we uniquely mm -hmm. qualified to do? In addition... You get phrases like let's go viral, which is a trend or a tactic that people start buzzing about, right? You start latching on to all the wrong things as a leader for directing your team or as a person internally. So I like this idea of the aspirational anchor because what it does is it anchors you to something in the future and then it forces you to consider why are we uniquely qualified to go and get that? And in the case of Merriam-Webster, they were witty and warm and wonderful people. And so they started tweeting out all these funny things and using emojis. Um, their best kind of breakthrough piece was a blog post declaring that the hot dog was a oh, sandwich. That's right. And like, the that's internet right. lost its mind. 
the internet the internet went crazy on them and they had yeah. all kinds of debate but look nobody was talking about them before and by taking a stance by being witty and wonderful and sarcastic and all these things they actually are as people the world took notice and so some of the stats that they were able to get they grew their follower count by I forget the percentage but they now have over 640,000 Twitter followers they grew their social media impressions 6,000% year on year and their press coverage 7,000%. So all of this, according to Lisa, simply happened because it wasn't manufactured. It was just who they actually are and who you are is your unfair advantage because no one else has access to that. And by putting this statement on the board, this aspirational anchor, she unlocked that for the team and the results came afterwards. So that's the first kind of step is to, to go within, examine your team, your people. What is it about you? And how can you articulate that desire to unleash you onto your marketing, your sales, whatever, in a simple statement? You know, something to get people to aspire to do better than the average kind of best yeah. practice repetitive no, work. I, 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 I'm really following you here. And and I, I've kind of, uh, or we, we here at our company have really kind of pivoted in our line of thinking like that as well, because at some point in time, and you're right, you know, the new shiny things like automation was all the rave, uh, rage, um, what, six years ago, the people, you know, who really, who really tapped into it because they had a competitive advantage and, and they were, but then that everything gets caught up. You know, Mark Schaefer talks about content shock, content overload, and, and it's just out there. And we've really, really on the accounts that we work with, uh, have, have pushed back to the client and really try to figure out what, you know, what do you have to say? You know, what makes you unique? What's different about you? Because all the other stuff, all that tactical stuff, it's, it's still there. It's still there to push everything out. But what, what, what I'm hearing you say, and I think it's brilliant, is, okay, listen, that's all there. But that's not what you should be concentrating on. Everything needs to be front loaded. And, and we did do a podcast with Anne Hanley as well. And she was speaking to the same sort of tune. Like all of your thinking needs to be up front. Now, where you're, but now you're taking that to the next level is as you're thinking that through, concentrate on what genuinely you and your team have to offer to the world and be unique for that. And then from that can come a lot of tactical execution. From that could come podcast or videos or writing, but it's all going to stem from that uniqueness, that creativity. Am I, are we on the same page here? It's all about turning a faulty equation, which is what a best practice is into something more yeah. specific for your situation. It's adding in the variables that those conventions and trends don't take into account and can't exactly. because they're not you. Um, so yeah. it's not that we're throwing to the wind all this stuff. Is that we're trying to either make sense of how much of it or mm -hmm. which ones we should use or how to tailor it to our situation to make it work for us in better and better ways. So, you know, the first and biggest variable in every situation, which is why I started there, is you. If I remove you from the equation and replace you with somebody else, the work is going to look slightly different. So the first thing you have to understand is, is yourself. Like, what is your aspirational anchor? And then what's your unfair advantage in reaching it? Like, what is it about you and your team that lets you do that? You know, but you can't, you can't stop there. It's not enough to just say, we understand ourselves. So, you know, we're sarcastic like Merriam Webster. And so now our results will flow in. Like, that's not enough. The next variable is you have to understand who the work is for. And, and I don't mean you need to, I don't know, like look at a report on your customer's behavior. That's a, nice piece of it. What I do mean is from that data, you have to pull out an insight and not just any old insight, but something I call a first principle insight. You have to get really deep about what the heck the customer actually wants, right? Like nobody buys a better pillow. They're buying a better night's sleep. So if you sell and market that people might say, oh my gosh, finally, you understand why I'm interested in hearing from your marketing. Um, and I think a really great example here is death wish coffee. So this is a coffee brand that promotes itself as the world's strongest coffee, but they don't actually sell coffee. They sell the ability <laughs> to work yourself to death. And because that's what the customers they serve want. Like when, when Mike Brown, the founder started that brand, he noticed all these truck drivers and entrepreneurs and construction workers, like hard charging people asking for strong coffee and they didn't care how it tasted. So he did something that seemed crazy according to the best practice, which was he used a bean called Robusta that coffee experts frown upon 
because it doesn't yield all that flavorful, earthy tones that most people want in their coffee. Well, he's not serving most people. He's serving these hard charging people, right? He's creating the world's strongest coffee. So what he realizes, that's what they actually want. They want the ability to work hard. They don't care about the artisanal experience of coffee. So from the outside looking in, it's insane that Mike chose to roast that bean if you know anything about coffee. But when you know his context, when you know the first principal insight of what his customers really want, now it actually makes sense to buck the trend in his scenario. So that's the second piece of this. Yeah, you, you got to understand yourself, but you also have to ask, what is your first principal insight about your customers? And then can you find a few true believers to test that against? You know, Can you get a few people to react really strongly to this idea that that is actually mm-hmm. what you sell? I got you. So you got to connect your, you know, there has to be some connection there, obviously, right? I mean, just from a practical standpoint, but that's, you know, you're, you're bringing a little bit of practical into the intuition and your uniqueness. I mean, they wanted to have the strongest coffee and and that's what he was going for, but it, it was based, you know, a large part upon what he knew about his audience, right? So, I mean, you, you know, if you're going to be a coffee maker and you're the best tricyclist, you know, and you have all that talent, it might not work here, right? <laughs> so there, there's obviously... Hey, well, you know what? Hold on. All right, we'll challenge it. Go I would for challenge it. that. I would here's, here's how I challenge it. There is, a, there is an actual guy I spoke to on my show about a year and a half ago. His name is um, uh, Alessandro... Oh my gosh, I forget his last name, but it was something beautiful like Bellini. He's an Australian... Uh, he's a, an Italian-Australian who now lives in Boston. So he's got a beautiful accent. He runs a coffee business called Grace Note. Just so happens to be another coffee brand that we're talking about here. It's called Grace Note. But where he started was he ran what he called the coffee trike. He was like this active biking kind of guy. He would go, he basically have a bespoke trike that he would bike around Boston, posting up in different popular spots with an espresso bar on the back. And it's like something about that guy led him to start, you know, in this case, a gimmick doesn't always have to be a gimmick, but in his case, he knew something about himself that made him say, you know what, this could actually work. I'm not going to set up a regular espresso bar, at least not at first to get started. I'm going to create the coffee trike, right? So We've been talking a lot about self-awareness, but I also want to hammer home this point that it's also about customer awareness, right? The variables missing from best practices are people and resources specific to your situation. There's two types of people, you and the people you serve. And then there's your your resources, your your abilities to actually make that work happen. So if you factor in those three things, first and foremost, that is understanding your context. That is how you set yourself up to, to mm-hmm. vet all the advice out there. Awesome. Did you... Um I definitely have some some follow up questions on on getting into this this flow state. But did you want to? Did you have some more steps to the, sure. the process of, of of getting into you know marching forward with intuition here? You mentioned. Well, okay. let's talk about the last part because we talked about you know the two questions you can ask about you and your team, the two questions okay. you can ask about your customer. You know what's your first principle insight and who are your true believers. Okay. But the last piece is your resources. Cuz you know as as a professional speaker I get this a lot. I'll give an example that's B2B and if it's too big of a brand, a small B2B company will say, "Yeah, but I'm not GE or I'm not IBM or I'm not HubSpot." Or you know, a, a B2C company will say, "Yeah, but I'm not a B2B brand." And so people always disassociate because they're pointing to their resources. Like I don't have as much time or as many people or as much budget. So it's important to consider that third variable in your context too. And, you know, one example I love citing is Camille Ricketts who runs content and uh, marketing for first round capital. So, so David, Uh, are you familiar with first round at all? not not, Not on the marketing side. No. Okay. So, so they're, they're a venture capital firm that invests in the early stages of tech companies growth. And to date, they've invested in like some of the world changing companies we keep hearing about, uh, you know, Square, Warby Parker, Uber, On Deck Capital, the list goes on. Um, when Camille started at the company, she needed to launch a blog. And that blog later became what most people call the Harvard Business Review for startups. It's a blog called the First Round Review. But she didn't build that blog because at any point she had permission to do so or even budget. Despite being (laughs) at a VC firm, she didn't have much budget. She just took, she strung together several successful tests and basically worked her way up to that. So the first test was without a writer on staff and without much time, she decided that instead of writing original pieces, she'd transcribe popular speeches in the startup world onto the blog. And so it was just a test. It was like, can... Can this practical startup-focused advice 
whereas most VCs try to promote thought leadership, can this practical advice actually work on this blog? And when she got some feedback from people saying they loved it, she held it up to her bosses and got more resources. And then she created a, a few original essays with a freelance writer. And then she held that up to her bosses and got more resources. And she hired a full-time writer and on and on and on until today, there's articles, community groups. They've even built out original research reports and even apps to serve their audience. And that's what we see. We see the final big product. And we're like, that's amazing. I could never do that. We disassociate. So I'm not asking you to follow the best practice of building first round review because it's easy to point to your resources and say, well, I don't have that ability or that audience. I am asking you to ask yourself, what are your actual constraints? Because if you can embrace them, studies will show us you'll come up with more ideas and also better Mm -hmm. ideas at the same time. So if you know what your constraints are, that's another variable these best practices can't take into account. And you can test your way forward. You can then ask the last question in this little equation, which is, how can you expand? And I'm not talking about blasting through one little test and then being like, okay, I'm ready for all the budget and all the success. No, it's, you know, we want the open field. It turns out when you put enough boxes down on the field, you cover a lot of ground, right? Like little by little, Camille created something big. She focused on learning and iterating quickly. And that's what we need to do too. So you've learned about yourself and your team. You've learned about your your customer or your audience. The last thing you have to consider is your resources. What are your constraints and how can you expand if you Mm -hmm. have a successful test from there? Now that you know these three things, you know your context and you know what you're trying to do. And all that advice out there, it stops looking like answers and it starts looking like possibilities that you gotcha. can work with. No, I love the way you're putting that. And, and, and what you touched on, you obviously have worked with people from the ground up because uh, that, that gets missed a lot. Um, e- even circling back around how to get to that point, because... It is fun and easy, you know, when you go to these big conferences and the guy, you know, and they bring in a guy from Coca-Cola that shows you this video of around the world, people communicating by getting free Coke. And it's just like, <laughs> feels so overwhelming. You know, it's like that probably cost millions of dollars. Like, come on. Right. But they're fun. To, you know, they're fun examples to point out. They make for a good speech. They make for a good conference. But, you know, helping people scale up is 99% of the audience really trying to do this stuff, right? The Coca-Colas are the 1%. So I love how, how you, you know, you're, you're putting that and giving people, I think, hope and inspiration that they can accomplish it, but just, you know, take one step at a time. I think one of my favorite sayings I heard not too long ago is inch by inch is a cinch by the yard is hard. And, and if you think, I know it's a great saying, I forget who said it. I actually wrote it in an article I submitted the other day and I wanted to reference somebody, but I didn't, I forgot who's where I heard it, but, um, but it makes so much sense. And, and that's, and that's the mindset we all can have to understand that you can get there. And, and, and Jay, you're pointing that out greatly. Now I, I do want to circle back because a lot of this is talking about that, you know, the, the epiphany, that, the, the, that intuition at work, the ideas that come out of that. You know, we all are all most likely guilty of coming into work and you start working, right? And, and it's hard to get into that flow state. You know, you, you do hear, hey, first thing in the morning, do this stuff. But life gets in the way. People have kids to take care of. They have their emails to return. They have all this stuff. And, you know, at the end of the week, you're like, I didn't do any big thinking, right? Help us get into that flow state, you know, that creative part of your brain. What have you heard other people do? What do you do? How can we, you know, really encourage people to try this out to hopefully get into that, you know, creative process, you know, in the best way? Follow what I'm saying. Yeah. Look, it doesn't matter what I do. I do, but it doesn't okay. matter what I do because what I do works for me. And and so I think you need to get into the mode of figuring out what works for you. And so if I tell you, this is, this is what I do. I don't have productivity hacks. I don't have a process that I feel is well ironed out. I feel like I'm organized. I use technologies like Trello and Evernote. But I think my hack, if it's even a hack, it's not a hack, but my mentality, my approach is I need to find a way to make the work mm-hmm. fun and find joy in the process. Because that's who I am. That's what works for me. 
But who gives a shit if Seth Godin writes a blog post a day or Anne Hanley writes her blog or her books in a tiny house or Joe Polizzi is saying that content marketing is the way to go or, you know, Michael Stelzner is talking about Snapchat because he cares about social media or I beat my chest about podcasting. Who gives a shit if any of that doesn't work for you, right? It doesn't, we look, we obsess over everybody else's answers for us. The switch we have to make, and I think this is the difference between having an average career and an exceptional one, is we have to stop obsessing over everyone else's answers and start asking ourselves the right questions. So yeah, you have a lot of emails. You have a ton of demands from clients and customers and bosses. The world changes a ton and it's stressful as hell. Not to mention, there's all the personal stuff you're dealing with in your family, Mm -hmm. with your friends, with your health, everything. Everyone else is dealing with the same thing too. And the way to work around that isn't to keep spinning this wheel of, oh, it's this answer or it's this best practice, it's this expert. No, it's to break that wheel. It's to understand what you're trying to do. So in the time it takes you to go Google search something, string together five sessions of you Googling for your answers, make it a little 30-minute session on Friday on your calendar and sit and reflect about these questions. Like figuring out what you're trying to do first, figuring out what you're all about, understanding your own situation first and foremost having that level of awareness, that trumps everything. You know. So what you're saying is, we're all stressed out, so give me the cheat, the hack, the shortcut, the tip, the trick. Mm-hmm. And those are fine to start with. But at some point, you're going to run into this problem, which is you look like everybody mm-hmm. else, you're doing commodity work. So th- this is what I'm passionate about, David. And, and you're getting me real fired up. And hopefully it's, hopefully it's making for some, some sense here. But we aspire to be a 10 out of 10. And we feel like too much of our work is out of five. And I'm so frustrated and fed up with our attempts to close that gap by clinging to someone else's answers. I think we all have what it takes to do exceptional work, but we have to start by figuring out what makes mm-hmm. us an exception. Well, I, I, I hear you. And, and I love what you're saying because it does get frustrating when like there's one guy I read from Medium and I love his stuff, but you know, he talks about getting up you know, from five in the morning to seven. You know, <laughs> I was like, man, if I do that my entire social life or my intimate time with my wife in the evenings will get wiped away. Right. And I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'm not doing that. Right. And I, uh, and, and, and I've gotten to a point in my <laughs> life where it, it's, I feel like I'm in a decent rhythm of, um, creative. Cause I, I do what, what you kind of suggested, by the way, like I, I carve, I put it on my calendar, you know, um, to stop, you know, do my readings or stop, do my creative work, you know, and, and I try to, I know it sounds pragmatic to get into you know creativity, but I, I just put it on my calendar and I, and I carve out time, you know, and, and I act as if it's a, an appointment or something else, you know, and so, but that's me. Right. And, and I understand some people, you know, you hear over and over people talking about doing stuff in the mornings first thing, but you do have those people whose brains are firing in the evenings better. You know, I, it's, you know, I, they could be outliers, but we're all outliers, you know, when it comes to our personal, our personal, Exactly. But, but you're basically that, saying carve out the it. time though, right? That's like it, you got to carve know. out time to because you can't just, oh, I'm going to be creative right now, you know, like in the middle of, you know, your next task, I guess, right? I mean, because I, I appreciate what you're saying, but, you know, I also want to, I do want to draw on your experience, Jay. You know, I do, you know, you're connected to a lot of people who have broken through. You've seen a lot of companies who have broken through. So I'm not necessarily, and, and I love that you're not, I hate the experts that say, this is what you need to do because that's not going to apply to everybody. But, you know, let, let's just talk out, you know, how have you seen like teams get creative, you know, in, in, in a way that really tries to tap into the, the, the flow of, you know, just drawing out as much from the companies. Do you have any, any sort of advice on just like, you know, what you've seen, maybe a few other examples like, Hey, you know, I see this team does this or that does, or, you know, me and my team did this and this really worked well for us. You might want to consider it rather than, you know, this is what you have to do. Do you have any, any, anything to speak on in that regards? So here's the problem. I've seen teams that their biggest asset, the the way they unlock the best work for their teams is they do a lot of things together, you know, collaborative projects, um, Friday beers where they put a, a piece of content on the board or a campaign and they poke at it and deconstruct it. They're all in it together and they do exceptional work. I've seen other teams try hmm. that same thing and it utterly fails. 
right? I've seen, I've seen teams that are like, you know what? We need to let everybody kind of roam free or we're not going to have a headquarters at all. We're going to have a remote work staff, um, a remote team. So th- that's, that's the problem in all this is I can hand you on a silver platter something that I've seen work. But the problem is you don't know their full story and they don't know yours and I don't know yours. So for me to say everybody should be collaborative, the people that are like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. They're saying that because either one, they don't know themselves enough to know that that will or won't work for them. So, so I've packaged a compelling case and I'm, I'm convincing about it. Or two, they actually understand that, the, that, you know what, that is actually something for me. But then there's other people listening that are like, you know, I'm more of an introvert. I would hate that. So, so I think the question I want people to answer isn't how do I be creative or what do teams do to unlock more creativity? The question I want to answer is of all the tactics to be creative, what's the one that you think most will work for you, for you? And tell me why, can you explain why this one will work most for you? Because as you start to get those wheels turning, you're like, huh, well, I think this latest one Jay said about a beer session on a Friday poking at content, that one is going to work for us. Okay. Why? Well, you know, it's it's about teamwork, it's about collaboration, it's about innovation. Okay. Are the people on your team really outgoing? Would they like that? Oh, you know, like Tyler is. That guy would probably own the room. Jay is, he's super talkative. But, you know, Sasha's not and Bill's not, you know. Oh, and and then we just hired Larry, but he, we agreed to let him work remote, so he's going to feel left out and you know, you start to try to paint a picture that's really specific to you. So that's what I'm trying to get people to do. It's not to look ahead and figure out what's next. It's not to look sideways and figure out what they're doing. Take care of yourself first. Okay. All right, cool. Gotcha. Awesome. Now, just to kind of close here, you know, you you obviously seem to be big on, you know, the subconscious, big on intuition, you know, letting that drive your behaviors, which I think we all know the subconscious is really what leads to our behaviors and our behaviors are our actions and what we do. So I would love just to hear your thoughts. And if you have any advice here and you may or may not, but I would still love to ask this question to you. Let's just say, you know, you convince everybody in, in, or you convince some, and they're moving forward with this and really trying to tap into this more so that it can lead, you know, their future marketing initiatives and, you know, really the branding of their company, really. What do you have to notice either for yourself or for others where you might be falling back into your mundane habits? Are there any conscious things to look for where you can pay attention to your subconscious here? That's a great question. I don't necessarily think it's about paying attention to your subconscious. I don't think that's a physically possible thing. Um, but I, I, no, no, no. Consciously paying attention to your conscious thoughts, you know, knowing that, that that's going to lead to your subconscious. Um, I, I think it's about, I mean, I, let's keep it real simple, David. Like if you are satisfied with your work, if you're really fulfilled by the work that you do and you're getting the results that you want, none of this matters, right? You're doing what you want. Good for you. You yeah. won. And now just keep the game yeah. going. Um, so I think it's it's a simple yeah. yeah. No, that's a great answer, Jay. No, that's a great answer. But no. I think you nailed it. You know, pay attention to your happiness and your and your enjoyment and what you're doing. I mean, I think that alone is going to drive good actions. You know, are you happy? Are you fulfilled? Are you proud of everything you're putting out? I mean, I I, I I'm hearing you. You know, I think I think that's actually a wonderful, beautiful answer to that. <laughs> well, let me give you the punchline there. The punchline is I'm not asking people to ignore stuff, to not look for ways people are creative or not look for advice from others. No. I'm, I'm asking for the change I'm asking us to make is to, ch- is to switch from just clinging to that stuff to, to, to approach it more critically, right? Like ask questions of it, give yourself a moment in time to understand what you're trying to do, what you're all about and squeeze that, that information through that filter, right? In other words, um, it's not what we pick or what we do. That's the problem. It's how we approach that information, how we think of it and make sense. And if we can get better at that part, it doesn't matter what trend comes our way. It doesn't matter how many new gurus come pouring out of the woodwork because we're like, you know what? They have to go through my filter and I can make sense of it. I can be proactive instead of reactive in my work. Understood. Understood. Well, Jay, this has been a lot of fun. I love your passion. I love, I love, I love your, I love the way your brain works. And, and I think, you know, we you know, most likely the people, li- you know, listening to this, you know, have, are pretty familiar with a lot of the 
the, you know, the tactical execution stuff out there, you know, might even have a good understanding of content marketing, but I do think we get lost in the mundane. And, and I do think we need to hear from people like you that will, Hey, snap out of it, you know, be exceptional, be different. And this is something that you need to bring some awareness to, and it's going to help you drive everything. So I love, I love, 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 uh, hearing everything you, you have to say today. Uh, h- how can people continue to, you know, hear other good gems from you, Jay. <laughs> I'm easy to find on the internet. So they can just search for my name or they can check out my podcast, Unthinkable. But I really appreciate your time today. Awesome. Yeah. And just uh, for the listeners out there, uh, Jay's Twitter. And again, you can just Google him to find his podcast, which I highly recommend. It's just at J-A-Y-A-C-U-N-Z-O. All right. Awesome, Jay. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast. Feel free to go to magnificent.com forward slash blog to see the show notes for this interview, as well as those from many other of the world's top marketing experts. Have a great day.